Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so thank you for uh, continuing with us today. Um, coming up, we have uh, Jen Burns from HubSpot. She'll be talking about using the MITRE ATT&CK framework to level up your container defenses. Um, our sponsors are really what help make Forward CloudSec happen. Uh, they're paying for all of the, the space here in Salt Lake City. They're paying for our uh, AV company that's doing all of the live streaming, that's getting things in, uh, bringing in our speakers and getting them back out to you. So um, we want to thank Delvrisk. Delvrisk sent along the little note that basically said, um, we're a market research and data brokerage firm. We're happy to support the community and we're not going to try and sell anything to you. Um, so we want to thank Delvrisk and um, we'll turn it over to uh, Jen. Thank you. Hey everybody, thanks for having me here virtually today. My name is Jen Burns. You can find me on Twitter as SnareJen. I'm gonna to talk to you about how you can use attack for containers to level up your defenses in the cloud. So a quick background on me. I'm a senior security engineer at an awesome company called HubSpot, whose mission is to help millions of organizations grow better. Before HubSpot, I worked at MITRE, was the lead of Attack for Cloud, and actually got to lead the project that led to the development of Attack for Containers. So I'm hoping I can bring the perspective of somebody who was involved in the research for Attack, but also that of a practitioner who wants to actually take that information and use it. My fun fact is that uh, this is all actually my second career. My first was playing and teaching drums, so I'd say I'm a solid but not great drummer at this point. I'm also a somewhat decent rock climber. I love puns, apologize in advance for any bad ones in this presentation, and I'm a lover of animals despite being uh, extremely allergic to most of them. So what is actually on the docket for today? Basically, I'm gonna give a brief intro on attack for those that are less familiar or need a refresher on it. I'm gonna dig into how containers actually got added to attack, and then probably most importantly, how you can use attack for containers in your own organization. So to start, what is attack? I just want to reiterate that I am no longer a representative of MITRE or attack. Um, so these are my own thoughts and opinions. At its core, attack is a knowledge base of adversary behavior. I think the biggest thing that I initially misunderstood about attack is that it's actually based on real world observations. So it's not a theoretical idea of what adversaries could do. It's what adversaries have been observed doing in the wild. Probably the first question I asked every time I got a uh, submission about attack for cloud or containers while I was at MITRE was, have you seen or heard of an adversary actually uh, doing this? It's definitely important to understand techniques that red teams are doing and what can be done in an environment. But there can be value in knowing what adversaries are actually doing to help prioritize your defenses. Attack is also free, it's open and globally accessible. Anybody can use it. It provides a common language. Uh, you can use across multiple teams, your red teams, blue teams, uh, cloud ops teams, um, and then it's also community driven. And that actually played a, a pretty huge part in the development of Attack for Containers. I just want to throw in a note, if you want to contribute to Attack, I'd recommend checking out the guidelines at attack.miter.org and sending it in through uh, attack at miter.org, their email address, uh, or you can just bug Justin Roberts, who's the current Attack for Cloud lead, who is in the cloud security Slack. I think that some of the value of Attack can be understood using this Pyramid of Pain by David Bianco. This has been around for some time now. If you're not familiar, the idea here is that as you go up the pyramid, you hit things that are more difficult for an adversary to change. So things like hash values. If a bad actor wants to change the hash of a file to not get detected, they can flip an arbitrary bit and boom, their malware does the same bad actions, but it doesn't match a set, match a set of uh, known bad file hashes. IP addresses and domain names, as many of you know, are a little more difficult to change, but still fairly simple to do for a motivated adversary. Um, so really security controls that are built on these types of indicators can be uh, often straightforward to implement or utilize and also important and helpful, but you're often a step behind the adversary. 
if you're actually detecting at that level. But then at the top of the pyramid, those are the techniques, tactics, and procedures. These are the actual behaviors of adversaries. And just like any other human, behaviors for adversaries can be uh, difficult to change. So preventing and detecting at that behavioral level can have a lot of value for a defender. And that's also where attack lies. If you're not familiar with attack, this is actually the attack for containers matrix is visualized by the attack navigator, which is an open source tool that MITRE released. If you look across the top of the matrix, you'll see tactics. And those are the goals of the adversary. So gaining initial access or persistence or escalating privileges. And then the columns are made up of the individual techniques, which are how those goals of an adversary can be achieved. So in containers, it uh, might be something like escalating privileges by escaping to the host. So here's an example of a specific technique in attack. You'll see that there are sub-techniques within this technique, and sub-techniques are just considered to be more specific techniques. Um, each technique also has a set of platforms, which that technique applies to. For our purposes, we're focused on the containers platform, as you would expect. Uh, it also has which data sources can be used to detect this particular technique. It has contributors, has other metadata. Each technique also includes a set of mitigations and detections, and many also have procedure examples, and those are ways a specific software or group has used a technique. So that's the, the TLDR on attack itself, but why did containers specifically get added to this knowledge base? Uh, first off, I just want to mention that despite what the attack Twitter account said on April Fool's Day, Attack for Containers is uh, absolutely not focused on adversary behaviors in shipping containers. It's focused on containerized environments, whether in the cloud or on-prem. And right now, as you would expect, most techniques are related to Docker or Kubernetes. So why did containers get added to attack? First, it's just a logical expansion. When Attack was created around 2014, it only covered Windows. And then by the time I started working on Attack around 2015 or 16, it had expanded to cover uh, Linux and Mac OS as well. And then later um, it covered industrial control systems, the cloud, as many of you know, and also network devices. So containers was kind of a next logical step here. Next, the Center for Threat Informed Defense, or CTED, which is part of MITRE Ingenuity, provided support for this work. Uh, Microsoft released their own Kubernetes threat matrix, I believe, uh, almost a couple of years ago now. Microsoft is also one of the members of this Center for Threat Informed Defense. There's actually a joint blog out now about the difference between their threat matrix and Attack for Containers. But I think their work definitely helped push this development of Attack for Containers kind of towards the top of the queue. So the CTED, uh, they first sponsored uh, more of an investigation into adding containers into Attack and then contributed to that overall creation of the platform. And then finally, and probably most importantly, the community asked for this work and Attack is community driven. The community also helped us uh, conclude as a research team that the vast majority of the activity that they observed in containers led to crypto mining. This wasn't necessarily a big focus for attack, but there was also evidence from uh, many folks that adversaries were utilizing containers for quote unquote uh, traditional purposes like exfil and collection of sensitive data, but it's publicly um, underreported. So the attack team ultimately decided that this work was uh, an important addition to add to attack. And to kind of prove how important the community was in putting this together, here's the list of contributors to that initial release of Attack for Containers. So a special shout out to all these folks. Some names might be pretty familiar, uh, fewer at this conference. I'll say personally, I learned a ton from these folks and really loved that uh, so many people were willing to help put this together. So now to get into some of the fun stuff, how can you actually use attack for containers? So there are generally four main use cases for attack. If you check out that getting started with attack blog series, it's linked. Uh, each one is kind of explained in more detail. 
And these blogs focus more though on attack in the context of Windows, Linux, Mac. But a lot of those same lessons can apply to using attack for cloud or containers. So to fit the time today, I'm gonna to talk about uh, three out of those four use cases. And just kind of as a pro tip, when the container platform was added to attack, a handful of new techniques were created that are pretty specific to containers, things like escape to host, but a lot of the techniques already existed. And then we just added those uh, to attack for containers because that same technique could be carried out sometimes in a different way in containerized environments. Uh, for some of those techniques, there might not be a ton of info on that technique in attack itself about how it applies to containers. But when we were working on this through Miter Ingenuity, we wrote a blog series and some of that included giving more specific examples of how these techniques apply to containers. So I'd really recommend just checking those out if you're looking through a technique and are kind of stumped on how it might relate to containers. So for the use case of assessments and engineering, how can Attack for Containers help here? Well, it can really give you a way to measure the status of your current defenses. If you're already familiar with Attack, that heat map graphic on the right uh, probably looks pretty familiar. This can be uh, an output from an assessment, so a way to visualize at the technique level, <clears throat> something like confidence that this particular technique or set of technique techniques might be detected or which techniques are sufficiently mitigated in your environment. Attack for containers can also help really give an understanding of where improvements can be made. So if you aren't uh, detecting a certain set of techniques, for example, but you realize, hey, if I add a particular data source like Kubernetes audit logs, maybe Docker daemon logs, that would help me detect those techniques, then maybe this could point you in the direction of capturing and processing those logs can also help you figure out, hey, how would my uh, coverage of containers uh, improve by buying product X versus product Y? It can help you make those comparisons. So as an example of how you might start using Attack for Containers to assess your coverage in your environment, sometimes it's best to just start with a single technique that helps you not get overwhelmed or burn out by this, uh, what could turn into a, a quite a process so here, for example, we have the external remote services technique. This is one of those techniques uh, I mentioned that already existed in attack before containers was added, but it does have a little uh, blurb at the bottom of the technique page on how it applies to containerized environments. So you can use this information to start assessing how well your organization might cover this particular technique, either by preventing its execution or detecting it. So not every uh, technique is going to lay this information out so clearly in a tiny blurb at the bottom, but you know, with an understanding of your own environment, you can come up with your own set of requirements to start to figure out what your coverage is for a particular technique. So for this technique, the first way it mentions an adversary may gain an authenticated access could be through an exposed Docker daemon or API. So you might ask questions like, uh, is external access allowed on port 2375 where the Docker daemon might be listening? Do you have security groups that prevent this access or IP tables rule set? Might also want to assess whether or not that TCP socket is even enabled to figure out whether remote requests would be accepted. And then for detection purposes, are you gathering Docker daemon logs for processing of anomalous requests? Uh, another mention uh, method is via the Kubernetes API server. So questions here might be, do you require auth to access the API server? Uh, can it be reached externally or does it only allow access within a private VPC? Either way, you might want to consider here an adversary that already has internal access to your cloud environment. And then on the detection side, are you gathering Kubernetes audit logs to search for, for things like unexpected access to the API? And then next is the kubelet. Do you have the kubelet locked down using something like web, webhook token auth? Are you gathering kubelet logs for detection purposes? Uh, I'm probably starting to kind of see the pattern here. And then what about the Kubernetes dashboard or any other uh, web app that might provide a control or management plane for your containers environment? Is that dashboard 
externally accessible? Does it require auth to access it? These are all things that you can test yourself, maybe talk to experts in this area at your organization to figure out where you stand in relation to this particular attack technique. Uh, obviously, it's not a perfect science, but hopefully you can get some sort of reasonable value from going through a process like this. And it might even give you ideas on how you can attack your own environment. So here's just an arbitrary example of a set of mappings across attack for containers. Uh, it'll be up to you what kind of rubric you want for your own environment, but maybe you'll want to start with a detection confidence level, or maybe you'll want to start with um, mitigation level. You can also put these together, come up with your own rubric. Really the value though is to start to understand your environment and where you can improve. This also doesn't mean throw away uh, best practices or whatever compliance standards you're trying to meet. There isn't necessarily one-to-one um, -one mapping between advice on how to harden a container's environment and how an adversary might attack that environment. So it's really important to be able to kind of understand both. With attack, you really just get more of a, a real-world idea of what hardening your environment prevents an adversary from doing. So next use case, threat intelligence. Uh, this actually played a pretty big role in how Attack for Containers was even developed. The research team took open source and contributed threat intel and then used that information to create the containers platform and attack. So how does this help us? First, it can give a common language across teams, like I mentioned early on. This was actually one of the reasons Attack was created in the first place was to give the red team and the blue team working on a particular project at MITRE a common language so they could understand each other. It also just helps us better understand what behaviors adversaries are actually doing in containers environments. There are so many things that adversaries could possibly do. It's important to know, you know those cases as well, but this really helps us prioritize based on the actual threat landscape. So here's an excerpt from a threat report put out by uh, Palo Alto Networks about the Hildegard malware attributed to Team TNT. You can actually go through this report and start to understand how it maps to attack. So you can see that the adversary gained initial access here by executing commands on kublets that allow anonymous access. This maps to the technique I was actually using earlier as an example, external remote services. Then the malware uses the kublets API to specifically execute commands inside containers. Then it drops a couple tools, one that could break out of containers, so the escape to host technique and attack here. And then it could access cloud resources via exposed cloud credentials. The access of those cloud credentials maps to unsecured credentials, cloud instance metadata API. And then you'd likely pivot over to the infrastructure as a service matrix and attack for follow on activities there. So what do you really gain from this? First, you can pass something, something like this over to your red team and say, hey, we heard that adversaries have done these techniques. Can you see if they're possible in our environment? It can also just give you an idea of the threat landscape and where you might wanna focus your resources. And then that leads directly into the final use case I'll talk about, which is adversary emulation. How can attack help you here? First, it can help ensure that you can actually detect and mitigate what you expect. So maybe you'll carry out a specific technique and see if your assessment of that technique is accurate. It can also just provide a sanity check for your red team on what behaviors are being carried out by adversaries in the wild. This might help them focus on specific techniques that adversaries have carried out that are uh, in environments similar to yours. So when Attack for Containers was released, three new malware were also released that relate to containers, Kenzing, Hildegard, and Doki. If you go to attack.miter.org, click on the Kenzing malware, for example, it gives you a link to the Attack Navigator to show you which specific techniques Kenzing uh, relates to. It also lists procedure examples and links to open source threat intel that are related to Kenzing. So you can use those procedure examples and the mapped threat reports as a guide on how to uh, emulate this malware and its deployment in your own environment. And you may want to use this um, as a guide for your own engagement.
And quickly before I finish up, just want to throw out there a set of adversary emulation and assessment tools that other folks have created that have helped me and might be helpful for you. Uh, Red Cube is a collection of kubectl commands. Cube Hunter searches for security weaknesses in clusters. Uh, Kubernetes Goat is a great place to learn and practice emulating an adversary without destroying your prod uh, environment on accident. Cubescape is a tool that helps uh, test against the Kubernetes hardening guidance that was put out recently by the NSA and CISA. And then finally, Kubebench checks deployments against the CIS Kubernetes benchmarks. And that is it. So once again, I'm SnareGen on Twitter. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're hiring at HubSpot. Feel free to hit me up at any point about that or uh, anything else. And thanks again. Anybody in the room have a question? I didn't see any in Slack, so. Cool. All right. Well, um, I, I think, uh, you know, Zach wanted a bad pun, and I don't think we got a bad <laughs> pun. So if you have a bad pun, we'll take that. Okay, I'll work on that and post something to Slack. Fair enough. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Oh, oh hold on. We have one question. Okay. Uh, what was the third malware that you mentioned um, in your list? Uh, you Kenzing and Hildegard? And then what was the yeah, Kenzing, Hildegard, and Doki, the Doki malware. Cool, thank you. Or Doki, D-O-K-I. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.